Okay, let's get started. Um, again, as usual, a couple of announcements before we <clears throat> move on. The first of those is unfortunately, this is a little ahead of where we are in terms of the lecture, but we did talk a little bit about bacterial and human DNA methyltransferases. So what makes the 5-methylcytosine that when it gets deaminated is a real problem because it comes thymidine. Um, so seminar speaker in the chemistry seminar series, which is Fridays, this Friday at 3.15, um, Science Building 1, Room 107, about bacterial and human DNA methyltransferases contributing to the cell cycle aging and tumor agenesis. My question is, how the heck does a bacterial methyltransferase have anything to do with cell cycle aging and tumor agenesis? As far as I know, E. coli doesn't make tumors. Um, and aging of E. coli I don't think makes a huge amount of sense. There is a bit of a cell cycle in E. coli, so maybe that's what it's about. So, you know, go to the seminar, um, check it out, find out what's going on there. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention <coughs> was, if this is actually going to show up here, I guess the lights, we need lights, camera, action, there we go, lamp, uh, is the biology seminar, which tomorrow at noon is going to be from a guy from OHSU who's looking at I think Staphylococcus, but much more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, because he's talking about viruses, is Eugene Koonin from the NCBI NIH, who will be talking about evolution of viruses and antiviral defenses from genomic and metagenomic data mining. Um, so this, Eugene is one of the real pioneers in bioinformatics and studying of biology by looking at sequences, thinking about evolution, et cetera which is another reminder that next week on Thursday for the biology seminar and also for Darwin Day, which is the 12th, um, we'll have a seminar speaker who will be talking about science communication and how to go about doing that. So um, lots of cool things happening in the next couple of weeks. So with that, we'll move back to here. Yeah. They're getting discounted tickets. So yeah, in fact, so the question is about the Linus Pauling Lecture se Series and how we can get cheap or discounted tickets. Um, I know that PSU is a co-sponsor of it. Um, I will look into that. Best thing to do is send me an email about those because Eugene Koonin is also going to be giving one of the evening lectures about how viruses are critical for evolution and life as we know it. Yeah? Uh, is there a central place where all of these uh, events are located on your page or PSU's page? Um, <laughs> there should be. <laughs> Um, I'm not always as good about updating my web page. Um, I try and post these things to D2L. I haven't done that for this one yet, but I certainly will. Um, certainly the Eugene Koonin one I posted to D2L, so I'll try and have things on D2L. Um, I also do have a lab Facebook page, and everybody's into Facebook. I got dragged into it kicking and screaming. Uh, but <clears throat> I also try and post things there. So if you're interested, you can link to that page. The biology department also has a Facebook page that you can link to and get all these seminars and information on it. Uh, yeah, a lot of cool stuff going on um, above and beyond double-stranded breaks, which is, um, of course, we're going to be talking about after we have our clicker questions. Not quite sure how that happened to go them backwards here. Um, but <clears throat> so the most common DNA damaging reactions, which we discussed in class, are pyrimidine dimer formation due to UV radiation, alkylation, oxidation, reduction, or hydrolysis. And by the way, it's not the most commonly discussed in class, but the most common uh, DNA damaging reactions. So sorry if that's confusing. <laughs> Just realize that reading it. So now we talked about most in class, so what happens most frequently?
can. Five. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the most common kinds of demutation, which we did talk about last time, what happens is you get what? Depurination. What kind of reaction is that? It's a hydrolysis reaction. So it's cutting that bond. Um, and in the figure, in the notes, and also in the textbook, any place where there's a blue arrow, that was a hydrolysis reaction. Okay, and that reminds me, um, if <clears throat> there is a discrepancy at any point between what ends up in clicker questions or what I say in lecture and what you're reading in the book or elsewhere, let me know because it's distinctly possible that, highly improbable of course that I'm wrong, um, but it has been known to happen, will happen again. So um, please call me out on stuff like that, not necessarily in lecture. Uh, but um, let me know, and I will go and look things up. Yeah? Can you just clarify then, deamination, is that also hydrolysis? Deamination is also hydrolysis, yes. So both. So, yeah, really, very, very, very common. Um, so those, yeah? And so this is what you said about uh, the environment of the cell being wet and warm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so yeah, that's yeah, backing up, backing up again. And so it's basically it's because, because it's an aqueous environment um, and you know, to some extent oxidize, uh, the oxygen is present as well, and so you will have some oxidation as well, but that turns out to be much, much less than the hydrolysis that takes place. Yeah? What about A? What happens when you shine the. Because that's much less frequent that you have um, your UV irradiation, so you've got to be exposed to UV. 99 plus percent of our cells are never exposed to UV. That's true probably of most cells in most environments. So you're not going to have a lot less of that. <clears throat> okay, so our next clicker question is, in the absence of a uracil DNA glycosylase, a mutant, you would expect more transition mutants than transversion mutants, more transversion mutants than transition mutants, um, the same number of transition and transversion mutants, uh, version mutations, no mutations, less mutations than in the presence of a uracil DNA glycosylase. <clears throat> this may require a little bit of thought. Maybe. Ten, time to start guessing. <clears throat> Four. Okay, what, <clears throat> what does uracil DNA glycosylase do? It removes uracils. Opposite what? Well, so cytosines are what have been mutated and then get removed. And so what's on the opposite strand? Ah, just after you have the change, after you have the DNA damage, what's on the opposite strand? What's appropriate is G, right? So if that gets repaired under normal conditions, what would get put in? A C. Right. In the absence of this, what's going to happen? It'll end up with a uracil. What does uracil base pair with? It's going to base pair with A. So going from G to A or C to G, oh, sorry, C to A is going to go, ah, C to T. See, I obviously can't talk either. Um, <laughs> but the answer is still correct. Um, going from 
C to U, really, but C to T in terms of your base pairing interaction, what kinds of mutations are those? <laughs> transitions and transversions. OK, so I guess there was some confusion about that. So transversions are the big changes, the ones that go from purines to pyrimidines, pyrimidines to purines. So the thing which is going to happen there is it's just going to be a, a long-term base pairing-wise. So eventually, you actually will end up with U in your DNA, and that's what happens in this case. But all of the Gs that were otherwise base paired with the Cs are now going to turn into what? As. And so you have lots of Gs to As. This would be transitions, not transversions, because they're still all purines to purines. So what's the correct answer? A is the correct answer to this. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> today I want to talk about double-stranded breaks, the other way of repairing double-stranded breaks, which is homologous recombination, and also talk a little bit about transposition. Transposition is jumping genes, things that move around. Uh, turns out that particularly transposition and to some extent double-stranded break repair is really critical for current biotechnology. In the absence of homologous recombination, uh, a lot of biotechnology would not exist. In the absence of transposition, my lab class that I'm teaching next term that I'm going to plug a whole bunch in the next couple of weeks because you can sign up for it, uh, called Recombinant DNA Techniques. The real name for it should be Mutant Viruses from Hell. Um, <laughs> And that's what you work on in this lab. You work on mutant viruses from hell. I think it's kind of cool. But um, I'm more than happy to talk more about that, and I will be doing that um, in the next couple of lectures when people have time to sign up for this. So <clears throat> we're talking about what's going on here. On the right-hand side, it's another double-stranded break that takes place. But unlike non-homologous end joining, where you chop in a little bit and put the ends back together, here what happens is you repair this break, which also gets cut in a little bit from the ends, from a sister chromatid or an extra backup double-stranded copy of DNA. As an overview, what happens here? Okay, you have a break. And then what happens? You have this process called strand invasion. And what strand invasion is, is it's a single-stranded piece of DNA, which has been generated after this double-stranded break. One of the strands get cut in. You have this three prime end that's not base paired to anything. This three prime end goes and finds a homologous chromosome, homologous related by ancestry. Related by ancestry means it's got a similar sequence. And so you can have base pairing interactions that interact with these two. Once you have this strand invasion that takes place, now you've got a three prime OH from this invading strand, and a template from the opposite strand, you can have synthesis by our friends, the DNA polymerases. Um, we'll check on what exactly which one of them they are. Um, and then after that, this is great, because you can now have extension from your other three prime end on this other strand that got pushed off. That's the one which is going to be homologous to this end. You end up with these really incredibly convoluted and twisted over DNA structures you then need to pull the two of them apart. And that's what's called a holiday junction, and particularly holiday junction resolution. And it's cutting and pasting and putting the DNAs back together. So we'll look at some details about this um, as we move along. At first, you might say, OK, this is only going to happen in a diploid organism. But it turns out that most organisms, even things like E. coli, are diploid at least some of the time. And that's right after you undergo replication. So this is a classic example of how in E. coli, you can end up with double-stranded breaks that get repaired by homologous recombination. So you have a replication fork. Here's our leading strand. Here's our lagging strand. And there's a problem in the DNA. In this case, it's a nick. It's a break in the phosphodiester backbone. The leading strand gets to this point and, uh-oh, now falls off. So now you have a double-stranded break here, in fact, nothing at the end at all, but you have this homologous sequence here on the strand which you've just replicated. Now, just like what happened before, we have 
degradation of the 5 prime n. This is coming in from an end, so it's an exonuclease, generating this 3 prime overhang. That 3 prime overhang will go and base pair now with this sequence right here so that it can continue to extend. And so now you remake your replication fork. You continue along here. Now you've got what looks like a pretty standard lagging strand. So you can have your primase and extension, Okazaki fragments, etc. on this side. And then <clears throat> your crossing over here. This is what's called the holiday junction. The strands are switching over. We'll look at these in more detail in just a second. Uh, that then needs to get cleaved and rejoined. And so basically what happens is this piece gets chopped and hooked up to that end. This piece ends up back over here. So you can fill things back in. This is how homologous recombination is happening probably in E. coli. And it's really important to make sure that you get good replication. Particularly if you think about the E. coli genome. I'll get to you in just a second. Uh, five million base pairs, two replication forks that go all the way around. If you have any kind of problem with the DNA, and we already talked about all kinds of hydrolysis issues, et cetera, that you have to have ways of dealing with these kinds of problems. And it turns out that breaks in the phosphodiester backbone are not that unusual. Yeah? Well, so we just looked at holiday junctions in genetics. Yep. The way that it was presented there was that it was actually two of the, you know, so is a holiday junction, does it need both sides, or can it just be that one portion of that one side? Okay, so the question is, sorry, I'll, I'll paraphrase here. Um, do you always have to have two holiday junctions, or can you just have one? Um, and so the holiday junction of it in and of itself is a four-stranded DNA complex. And again, we'll look at those in just a second. Now, normally, if you're talking about the homologous recombination that's not connected to a replication fork, you'll have two for the regular DNA repair mechanisms. However, here, you only have one. And the whole idea of a holiday junction is just one of them. But if you're talking about double-stranded break repair, in terms of mitotic chromosomes and mitotic recombination, which is probably what they're talking about in genetics, uh, there you have to have two because it's flanking the region which has been exchanged. Yeah. But you have two holiday junctions then. Yeah. Did this problem ever happen as a result of recovering one, like cutting one in the mix and then like instead of like it mixed in time? So the question here is could this be potentially an outcome of having a topoisomerase one? that has not reversed its reaction. Now, normally topoisomerase 1 would still be covalently linked through that OH to the tyrosine. So that would not, in fact, be the case unless it was still hung on there when the replication fork came through. And that's exactly how you could form one of these double-stranded breaks. Yeah, And as you're exactly right, topoisomerase 1 is going to be involved in replication forks, making sure that you're dealing with that. So you're, you're nicking the DNA all the time. And so it's quite possible that it's just left over from one of those nicks, yes. So usually here, so again, the question is, is this like a gene conversion or recombination that's happening in the bacteria? Uh, generally, in a case like this, you're going to have very few differences between these two because it's a replication fork. And so these were the double strands that you had there. And so any difference there is going to have to be what's happened just as you're doing replication at that particular point in time. So it's going to be relatively rare. On the other hand, when you're talking about something which is diploid, that's a very different story, and we'll, we'll get to that. OK, let's, that's a different story. And maybe we can talk about that offline, having to do with genetics. So let's not get too much into that at this point. I, I, I'm happy to talk more about it, but I don't think it's really germane to this discussion. <laughs> um, so how do you get this process to take place? One of the big problems is how do you have this strand invasion? So you've got this you know, single-stranded piece of DNA hanging out with a 3 prime OH on it. Somehow that's got to find its partner somewhere else. The way that happens is through 
a protein which in E. coli is called RecA. And I give you one guess why it's called RecA, because it's important for homologous recombination. Um, and <clears throat> when you have a mutation, you have problems in homologous recombination. So the RecA protein binds to single-stranded DNA when it's got this 3 prime OH hanging out here at the end. And in the presence of ATP, it makes this elongated structure. And this elongated structure is great at finding other strands that it can actually bind to. And <clears throat> when you have ATP hydrolysis, that will take this one strand here together with this double strand and basically exchange the strand that's bound to Rec A for the strand that's not bound to Rec A. And you end up switching the base pairings. This is the base pairing that you had. You come in with a Rec A bound strain. That Rec A bound strain will undergo strand exchange. And you can show this really nicely by purified proteins um, in the lab. In fact, the Crisell lab does this um, all the time. So that's the strand inversion step. If you think about eukaryotes, they basically do this all the time. This is probably getting back to genetics. Um, Maybe I should sit in on the lecture for genetics. Um, when you talk about meiotic recombination, meiotic recombination is something that seems to have to happen, and probably one of the reasons that we reproduce sexually and probably has to do with getting rid of deleterious mutations. Um, so it's a way of removing that. So whenever the sister chromatids are pairing, double-stranded breaks are actually generated. And they're generated by some specific protein. It's not important what their names are, SPOL11, MRE11, um, which generate double-stranded breaks. And then you have exonucleases that generate 3 prime ends. Strand exchange takes place. Protein in the case of yeast is called RAD51. Um, we'll look at that in just a second. It's the equivalent of RAD A. Uh, no, REC A. RAD51. Why RAD? RAD for radiation. What does radiation do to DNA? Makes what kinds of destruction of DNA? What are we fixing? Double-stranded breaks. So ionizing radiation makes double-stranded breaks. You have a rad mutant, then it's going to be susceptible, overly susceptible to radiation. So it's the way you can figure out what these things are. So <clears throat> those rad proteins are important for this. Okay, you have strand exchange, extension, and you end up generating these holiday junctions. Why do we care? Um, that's because we are diploid, and we really like to exchange genetic information um, here back and forth um, between parental chromosomes so that we can get rid of some of these deleterious mutations as well. We'll talk about this gene conversion and crossover in just a second here. So once you have this <clears throat> strand invasion, Synthesis, now we move to the second part of this. Once you continue your DNA synthesis, now you've got both strands that have exchanged, extended here. Now you need a ligation that happens between this end and that end, this end and that end, and that generates two holiday junctions, so the double holiday junction, getting back to your question before. Um, now, if you've got these two holiday junctions, and we'll look at this in just a second, it may not look like cutting here, up and down, and across is topologically identical to each other. But when you look at the double strands wrapped around each other, they really are completely equivalent. So approximately half the time, you'll cut here in the middle. And approximately half of the time, you'll cut up here at the top and re-ligate these ends. And what that does, it generates two different possibilities. And that's just by, again, you cut here, re-ligate here. So here you'd have orange going to red and red going to green. You cut here. Now you're going to have red going to orange next to your red. What that ends up doing is either giving you a what's called the crossover, where you end up with different ends next to these holiday junctions. There are two holiday junctions, which resolve. And so now you have. What started as being, we'll call red here, 
<coughs> paternal and yellow maternal. At one end, paternal, the other end, maternal. Here, maternal versus paternal. So you've actually literally crossed over. That was the blue and the red that we had on the last slide. Otherwise, if you have both of these that are cutting around the same way, you have what people will call a non-crossover or just a patch, where it's just this middle piece which has been exchanged from one strand to the other. Again, how does this happen? It's all about the strand invasion. Rec A is shown here. Rad 51 is the yeast protein, binds to the single-stranded with a three prime end and does this strand exchange where it pulls off one strand and puts on the other, and that's an ATP-dependent process. Once you've done that, what do you get? You get holiday junctions, and this is a view of the holiday junctions either in the electron microscope, and they really do look like these cross structures. So it's not like you have two continuous strands and one that's crossing over. They're crossed in open structures, and I'll put the link to this. I was uh, trying to find this this morning, but um, before lecture, I didn't get to it. Uh, this is a really nice, I think, animation of one of these holiday junctions. We've got double strands here, but that strand exchanges here with a different strand, a different strand, a different strand. And these will base pair and unbase pair here right in the middle. And what that means is once you've got one of these holiday junctions, if you're breaking a base pair, you're going to be forming a base pair. And what happens with these holiday junctions is they can move. They can move back and forth along the DNA, which turns out to be really important for gene conversion that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, really looking at these things in three dimensions I think is really hard. Um, and this is one of the actual an image of an X-ray crystallographic structure of basically what this looks like here. Almost always people are going to draw these holiday junctions like this. It's the way you've looked at them. But if you just take these two ends and flip them over to the top, that's what these guys really look like. It's just you can't draw those things very nicely in terms of the, the crossing over. So again, at this here, we've got just one X there with continuous strands on the other side. Really looks like this when you have your double-stranded DNA that's, that's wrapped around it. And if you look at this, now it makes much more sense that cutting and re-ligating top and bottom here is just like cutting and re-ligating across here, because these are identical structures. As far as the enzymes, which are going to come and bind and cut and ligate here, which are the holiday junction resolvases, they don't know whether this is you know, top or bottom or left and right, because it's a completely symmetrical structure as far as that's concerned. So I could take this and turn it 180 degrees, 90 degrees, you're still going to end up with the same thing. So that's how you can get this kind of recombination that either is going to cut on one side, it's going to cut on the other side, and just re-ligate those ends. Yeah? So there's one on the left, chromosome that's not crossed over, mm -hmm. one on the right, that's chromosome that is crossed over. Mm -hmm. If you had two coming from the top and bottom, both of them coming from the top and bottom, it would be without crossover again. That is correct. So if you've got, as they have to be the opposite orientation to give you a crossover. And the best way to do this is to sit down with two different colored pens or pencils and draw them out. And I'm happy to do that in office hours. I've done it many times before. Okay, so to some extent, why do we care? Um, the reason that we care is that this homologous recombination is a homologous recombination, and that means they're similar sequences to each other, but they're not going to be identical, and nowhere near as identical as you usually have them when we have E. coli. So that can lead to what's called gene conversion, because if you think about <clears throat> these sequences here, the green ones, these are now a copy of everything that was in red. And so here, it's all going to be that red genetic information that gets put into the yellow sequence. And this is just shown here um, with red versus blue. If you have a crossover, like you have here, now you've got red at one end and blue at the other end. And here, we just have the patch where both have um, been cut and re-ligated 
uh, similar to each other. Turns out in meiotic recombination, you end up with a lot more patches than you do crossovers. Really fascinating regulation that goes with that, way beyond the scope of this course. Uh, but because you have now sequence that's come from one strand versus another strand, in this case, you know, we'll call this paternal and this maternal, uh, you can sometimes have mismatches that happen here because then they're homologous. They're not identical to each other. If you have mismatches, then we have our mismatch repair machinery. Mismatch repair machinery will take out one of these strands and resynthesize it based on the information on the other strand. Well, unlike the case with replication forks, like you have an E. coli with a methylated strand or Nix strands as you have in eukaryotes, the repair system has no way of knowing which strand is the correct one or the incorrect one. So 50% of the time you will end up giving sequence which you had here. Other 50% of the time you'll end up with the sequence that you had there. And so in that way you can get like a non 2 to 2 segregation, actually probably getting back to what you talked about in genetics. Um, if you have gene conversion that happens, now you no longer have the normal segregation that you're going to have of alleles from the maternal allele and paternal alleles when you go through meiosis because you will have changed the information on one of those strands to whatever you had on the other one. And so that's one of the things that happens because of this homologous recombination. Okay, homologous recombination, happy, not happy, draw them out, come find me in office hours. So I want to talk about a couple more things in terms of DNA repair. Um, these are sort of the last ditch ways to deal with problems that you have in your DNA. A um, couple of different ones here, but most of them basically are we get to a problem in the DNA, say up here, we've got our polymerase happily replicating along together with its sliding clamp, it runs into a problem. Say a thymidine dimer, thymidine dimers are now, you know, they're cross-linked to each other so they can't base pair to anything. The polymerase has no idea what to put in there, so it stops. Also the structure, of course, of the DNA is different. In a perfect world, you'd have nucleotide excision repair, comes in, repairs it, everything's good. However, particularly if you have lots of DNA damage in the cell, you don't have enough of all those repair machinery to go around and fix everything. So what happens is, in particular cases of cellular stress, you end up making these what are called translesion polymerases or translesion pol. And just to make it more confusing, even more different DNA polymerases here. Uh, but what these DNA polymerases do is they will bind to our friend the sliding clamp. If it's in E. coli, it's beta, and if it's in eukaryotes, it's pCNA. And then put in basically whatever base pairs here, get past this otherwise block to replication, and then the normal polymerase can come in and extend from that. So basically what it does is it says, hey, we've got so much DNA damage, but we still need to get our replication done. We'll put in a couple of nucleotides. They're probably going to end up being mismatches. We hope that the DNA repair machinery will take care of it. We'll just try and get away with it. So here, um, in the case of E. coli, when you have lots of DNA damage, it actually activates the RecA protein, which not only is going to coat your single strands to allow this strand exchange to take place, but also <clears throat> is going to block a lot of other processes that are normally going in, on inside the cell. Uh, people also talk about this in E. coli called the SOS response, the save our souls response. So if you have a lot of DNA damage, lots of problems, you start expressing some of these, and I say expressing is making these error-prone or translesion polymerases that will just put in whatever nucleotides you need in order to get past this problem and just try and fix it later. 
We talked a little bit about ATM last time. Uh, this is one of those proteins that's mutated in a lot of cancers. It's a protein that's really important for this process and turning on this process, making sure that you've got the appropriate elongation that's taking place. Um, and if you have a mutation in this, then you have lots of problems. And again, usually in many cases, it's going to cause cancers as well. Take a look at one of those particular polymerases. This is one of the so-called translesion or error-prone polymerases in E. coli. The name of it is not important. What number it is is not important. But basically what it does is when the DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase 3, the normal replicating polymerase, gets to a problem that hasn't been fixed, then this translesion polymerase comes in, puts in whatever nucleotides, and then the regular polymerase comes in and will extend after that. One of the things that's important about this particular polymerase, and as you would expect, it's a non-processive polymerase. It falls off the DNA. Why is that useful? Because if it puts in whatever the heck nucleotides it wants, um, you're going to be causing all kinds of problems. Yes? If this were not a clamp, if I don't have this liability to clamp. Right, that was the clamp. And so these are actually slightly different <clears throat> um, different processes. Um, this is what happens more in the eukaryotic system, even though it's shown here as being the, the beta clamp. Um, turns out it's different for different polymerases. But it is very important that your translesion polymerases are not processive. Um, and in this case, it shows that, you know, looks as if it's associated with the sliding clamp, but this guy falls off really quickly. Because if it didn't fall off, you'd be putting in far too many mistakes. It's just staying there waiting for the replication. Waiting for the replication fork to, to move forward. Yeah? Are there mutations that are more likely to be this kind of repair kind of disaster? Is that more likely than other mutations? Um, it's pretty much any mutation which is going to block the polymerase. And any kind of block to the polymerase is going to be something which is changing the structure of the DNA. And so thymidine numbers are classic examples of that. But you can have interstrand cross links. You can have a number of other things which will lead to that as well. So it's not just an example, but it's only one example of it. OK, so um, we basically talked about all of these things already. Last time, we talked about some of the human diseases. Again, particularly cancers, which are very often at least the hereditary cancers, have mutations in genes which are important for DNA repair. Those mutations, transitions, transversions, which we just talked about at the beginning. Um, how do you do very specific repair? Um, I like to think of proofreading as sort of a repair mechanism. Um, some people talk about it, some people don't. Uh, but definitely mismatch repair um, is a way to deal with these kinds of mutations. People always talk about mismatch repair, and the textbook does as well in terms of what happens during polymerization, and things get fixed there. But also, you need mismatch repair to get gene conversion. If you've got two different kinds of strands with different information on them, you'll have that. Photoreactivation is just another term for photolyase, where you have a very specific change that happens. Again, pyrimidine dimers happen due to UV irradiation, and then photoreactivation, these photolyases need light, and they just reverse that reaction. The thymidine dimers which have formed, or the, should say, pyrimidine dimers which have formed, that then gets uh, <clears throat> released. Two basic ways, however, that happen in all organisms, basic scission repair, nucleotide excision repair. The basic scission repair has those DNA glycosylases that will go in and chop off the incorrect nucleotide. These have to be very specific, so like the uracil DNA glycosylase or the adoxo-G DNA glycosylase, very specific changes. Once that has been cleaved off, it looks exactly like a depurination or depurimidination. So now you have a AP site that the endonuclease will come in and cut next to, the exonuclease will cut out one base, that gets repaired. On the other hand, if you've got bigger mutations, usually ones, again, that are causing changes in the DNA structure. Now you do nucleotide excision repair, where you make two little cuts outside of that change, and you resynthesize the whole thing. Double-stranded breaks, which can happen because of NICs and single-stranded breaks. 
I have potential bitopoisomerases, but whenever you've got a single-stranded break, to replicate through that, you're going to end up with a double-stranded break. That is a problem. You also have double-stranded breaks that happen through ionizing radiation, but you also have double-stranded breaks that happen normally in meiosis because of those specific proteins that will cut and allow you to get the recombination that takes place there. How do you fix these? Um, the quick and dirty ways we talked about last time, non-homologous end joining, or you can use homologous recombination, which gives you a much more precise, but nonetheless, if you've got different sequences on the maternal and paternal chromosomes, or whatever your haploid happens to be, um, then those are going to give you um, a potential gene conversion event that takes place. And in the worst of all possible worlds, you say, okay, forget it. We're just going to throw something in so that we can finish replication and then deal with repairing it later. Okay, questions, more questions on, on DNA repair before we uh, move on and talk about transposons jumping genes. Yeah, so the question basically is why not, why do replication and then fix it later? Um, and that clearly for E. coli, if you've got two replication forks, um, they've got to eventually get their way around the genome. And so you've got a lot more time. If you're blocking replication at one particular point, none of the rest of that's going to get made. So if you go past that, you've got more time until you actually finish replication. And so that process is finishing the replication and then fixing them. So that's you know, it's a hand-waving argument. It's just the way it happens. Um, but it's a hand-waving argument, at least to me, that makes sense. If you think about eukaryotes, then it's that one particular part of the cell cycle, S phase, where you're going through and making all of these copies. Before you actually do cell division, you've often got quite a long period of time between that. So it seems that the rate-limiting step is really the replication step. Yeah, and as, you know, as we mentioned when we talked about replication, eukaryotic polymerases are really slow, probably because of the nucleosome uh, template. Okay, so let's talk about transposons. Um, there are three, I like to call them flavors of transposons. Uh, my favorite, of course, are these, because they're like viruses in the middle here. Um, <clears throat> but three main forms. This is what I call the DNA-only transposons. Transposons is jumping genes. So yeah, we're just talking about jumping genes here. Uh, People also talk about this as being the non-homologous um, non recombination, because these guys are genes that move around here. But there are a couple of ways that you can tell the differences between these transposons just by looking at their sequences. And that's basically what's shown here. These DNA-only transposons have these, what are called, inverted repeats at either end of the DNA-only transposon. Now, what do I mean by inverted repeat? Basically, what that means is on one strand, you have a 5 prime to 3 prime sequence. And on the other strand, in the opposite orientation, you have a, the same 5 prime to 3 prime sequence. So opposite strand, that's your inverted repeat. That's why these arrows are pointing in different directions here. On the other hand, the retroviral-like retrotransposons have all kinds of really cool characteristics, but you can tell what that they are these retroviral-like retrotransposons because they have these what are called direct repeats at either end. And so direct repeat just means that it's the same sequence in the same orientation, 5 prime to 3 prime, that's on the outside of your transposon. So inverted repeats, it's a DNA-only transposon. Direct repeats, they're retroviral-like retrotransposons. Then you've got some really funky ones, and it turns out most of our genome is filled with these. These are jumping genes that have AT base pairs, a whole bunch of AT base pairs at the end, and that's because they originally came from messenger RNAs that had poly A tails on the end, um, and you find many, many copies of these. What's present in the middle? We've got here now this sort of orangish bar. That's what's important for getting these guys to move around. Transposase, in the case of these DNA-only transposons, and here, reverse transcriptases and ways of getting them into the genome. Why do we care? Well, it's because most of our genome is made up of these things. Forty-odd percent are these non-retroviral-like transposons, which is actually about 35% of the non-retroviral ones. The retroviral-like ones are about 10%. 
And there are a few DNA-only transposons that are present in the genome. But this is almost 50% of our genome is made up of these jumping genes, which is really um, kind of amazing. And remember, just for comparison purposes, over here, our little protein coding part, really minuscule relative to that. Now, I mentioned that before, in those orange bits in the middle of the transposons, those are actually protein coding genes too, because they're encoding the proteins that you need. And so I try and be very careful when I talk about protein coding genes in the genome that are not repeated, because these are sequences that are repeated a whole bunch, and there are actually quite a few protein coding genes in these transposons. So one reason we should be interested in them is because a lot of us is made up of these transposons. Another reason, it turns out that a lot of antibiotic resistance that you find in bacteria, and particularly bacteria that make people sick, um, are present in these transposons. So this is a particular transposon. Again, the name is not important here, TN3, which contains a gene that makes the microbe resistant to ampicillin. TN10, which is in fact one of the ones that have been best studied, um, has a resistance gene to tetracycline right in the middle of it. And so a lot of the hospital-acquired isolates of many of these things actually have transposons in them, and these transposons are carrying around antibiotic resistance genes. So some of them can actually move from cell to cell as well. Um, quite an issue there. Um, the simplest one, or simplest ones, I should say, are those like this, which is a lot like the cartoon that we had a couple slides ago. Um, has a transposon gene, transposase gene, excuse me, in the middle, and these two inverted repeat sequences at either end. And so again, inverted repeat means that you've got CATG going from 5 prime to 3 prime here would be CATG on the opposite strand going from 5 prime to 3 prime over here. So those are your inverted repeat sequences. Why do you have these inverted repeat sequences? It has to do with how the transposase works. The transposase binds to these sequences that are at either end of your transposon. So here are transposases. It'll bind here. It'll bind there. These guys interact with each other through protein-protein interactions. And the molecular biologists love this zome term. You know, any kind of multi-protein, often nucleic acid complex. Remember, nucleosomes, proteins plus nucleic acid. The ribosome, proteins, nucleic acid. The transpososome. Well, a buddy of mine came up with the worst use of zome in molecular biology. People love to use these things. Uh, but you've got the transposase subunits interact with each other, and these inverted repeat sequences at either end of your transposon. The transposase will cut the sequence right here and move this DNA transposon to somewhere else in the genome. This is how it jumps. So it cuts here. You've got a broken chromosome where it's being cut out. This gets put back together by double-stranded DNA break repair. This transpososome goes to somewhere else in the genome, cuts here, and you'll notice that these two arrows are slightly offset relative to each other, ligates the transposon into this region, and that's all the transposase that does this job, leaving a little gap. And that's what this black thing here is supposed to be representing. These black things are the sequences that were complementary to where you had these offset cuts on either strand here. These can get filled in by normal DNA repair machinery. But because this sequence, the blue one here, ends up at this end, this blue one here ends up at that end, these were complementary sequences to each other. And so these gaps get filled in they end up giving you directly repeated sequences. This is a, the same sequence here, this black sequence here, as the sequence over here, because it came from this originally double-stranded sequence over here. So if you just look at a genome, and you're looking to see whether there's a transposon which is sitting there, you'll see a short direct repeat next to an inverted repeat, then your transposase gene your inverted repeat followed by a direct repeat. So again, inverted repeats, same sequence on opposite strands, always 5 prime to 3 prime, direct repeat, 
same sequence on the same strand. Yes, no, comments, yes. Right, so you know you have a DNA transposon if you have a direct repeat, inverted repeat, transposase gene, inverted repeat, direct repeat. <laughs> yeah, the best thing to do is to literally uh, you know, write out some of these sequences and direct repeats versus inverted repeats. Yeah? Can you write out one of these sequences? Um, I will, and I'm happy to do it in office hours. The problem is this horrible room has no blackboard. Um, and I actually, what I'll, do, what I'll do is I'll probably write one out. I actually don't have anything with me to write with. Um, next time, if we're still um, talking about this, I can write it out on the doc cam, and we'll talk about direct repeats versus indirect repeats. OK. Um, this is just what that transposase looks like. Um, here's the structure of the protein bringing these two ends of DNA and popping them into the genome where it's moved to and generating these direct repeats, inverted repeats. Yeah? Um, that feels like one of those really obvious questions, but why are we doing this at all? Why are we moving chunks of supposedly unusable pieces of DNA around that we're apparently using? So the, the question is here, <laughs> why, I'll paraphrase it, but why hasn't evolution just gotten rid of these damn things? <laughs> uh, um, so why, why are there transposons around at all? So if you think about it from the bacterium's point of view, again, we're going back to the, this, this mostly you find these in bacteria, um, it's clearly the bacterium's advantage to have an antibiotic resistance gene. So selection-wise, yeah, you'll hang on to it that way. Um, more of a question is something like our genome. You know, why do we have so many of these things in our genome? And there are lots of hand-waving arguments for that. Um, my favorite example of this is that none of us would exist if we didn't have these. And the reason for that is it turns out that this kind of transposon carries with it some virus genes. And those particular virus genes are important for formation of the placenta. And if we didn't have those virus genes, there would be no placental mammals. Why move them around? Um, that, that's, again, it's a great question. And it turns out there's actually ways to block them moving around, which we may have a chance to talk about later on in the class. Uh, but <clears throat> a little bit is OK. Too much is bad. And so, the, again, it's a little bit which is OK, which allows evolution. And the too much being bad would be you're trashing your genome by all these things jumping around. So it's this delicate balance between you know, lanes jumping around giving you good stuff and genes jumping around giving you bad stuff. And the wonders of selection giving you the good stuff versus the bad stuff. Yeah? You might have said this earlier, but how does the um, transposon? Pose on? Okay, so the question is basically, again, I'll paraphrase your question, is how specific are these transposons in terms of different places that you go into? The answer to that is they're usually very nonspecific. There are a couple of exceptions to that, but for the most part, they're very nonspecific. Yeah? How does the user find the genes? Like, do you have to go along and just say, I'm looking to see if this has direct repeat or an inverted repeat somewhere down the line, but you do that until you find one? So the question is, how do you detect these, these things in genomes? So basically, you look for the transposase sequence, if you're talking about these transposons, flanked by these inverted repeats and direct repeats. So that's Are all the transposases They're similar to each other. But if you've got transposons that are jumping around, and particularly true, we'll talk about those retroviruses here in just a second, um, they're going to have extremely similar sequences to each other. So because, and in the case of these you know, retrovirus-like sequences, um, they're copying and pasting, as opposed to the cut and paste that we just talked about, which is that chopping out, moving it, and putting it somewhere else. Most transposons actually are what are called replicative transposons. So they make a copy of it and then move that copy. But the original one stays there. And that's how you end up with many, many copies, all these repeated sequences that we have, for instance, in our genome. Yeah? Do we ever get to like, in the middle of being portion of the protein chain? 
So the question is, do um, transposons jump into important places like protein genes? Most spontaneous hemophilia has to do with these jumping into the wrong places. Um, great study done, well, almost 20 years ago now, looking at that. Yeah? So the question is, is this something, is this have something to do with what you're doing in the lab and DNA transfection, um, things like that? So we have a chance, we'll get, we'll talk a little bit about some of that um, later on today, but it's in the understanding of how these things work that we can use some of these tools to manipulate genomes. And so the, the mutant viruses from hell um, like, uh, lab class, which is happening next term, um, uses these guys making mutants with this exact technique. Yeah? Ah, so the question is, does it, um, does jump, a transposon jumping into a transposon make the first one dead? It depends on where it jumps into. Um, and if it disrupts the transposase gene, it could actually mess up the first one, but the second one could potentially be just fine. Right, so the, the question here is, you know, if you think about the human genome, you're much more likely to have insertions into other transposons than you are into these other genes, which is potentially why you want to have many copies of them. It's an insurance mechanism that you've got lots of copies of them. They're more likely to jump into these things that are not as critical as they are jumping into these, the critical sequences, you know, hiding in among the weeds, as it were. Okay, so let's talk about these not quite the most common in our genome, but a lot more common, it turns out, than those DNA transposons. Those are more common in bacteria. So this is basically how retroviruses replicate, whole lecture next term in virology. But basically, these guys have RNA as part of their genomes. That RNA gets made into DNA through the activity of a reverse transcriptase. Um, we already talked about reverse transcriptase for telomerases. Um, these reverse transcriptases were actually discovered first. Um, in viruses, they basically make a DNA copy of the RNA. That DNA copy gets put into the genome through the activity of a second protein called an integrase protein. Once it's integrated into the DNA, you, of course, can have more transcription, which makes more RNA that gets copied into more DNAs, which jump into the DNA, which make more RNAs, which make more DNA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the idea. In terms of the viruses, what happens, these RNAs get put into virus structures and then go out and infect something else. It's exactly how HIV replicates. And again, we'll talk more about that um, later on. What does this? It's the so-called reverse transcriptase enzyme. The reverse transcriptase is really just a DNA polymerase that uses an RNA template. So again, we talked about this already when we talked about the telomerase. So RNA template, you've got a... <clears throat> Reverse transcriptase, just like all other DNA polymerases, it has to extend from 3 prime OHs. We'll talk about that in virology next term, how that actually happens. Um, one of the neat things about these reverse transcriptases is, is that they don't just use RNA templates, they also use DNA templates as well. And so the reverse transcriptase makes not just that first copy of the DNA strand, as you can see here, RNA going to DNA, it also makes this double strand as well. So it's not only an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, it's also a DNA-dependent <coughs> DNA polymerase. You can use both of those two different templates. Um, this is what that enzyme looks like. It's a really cool enzyme. So they, again, they're just like DNA polymerases. They've got these thumb and fingers and palm. So you've got the active site down here, again, extending 3 prime OHs. These reverse transcriptases also bring their own RNase H with them, because it's a domain that's part of that. What does RNase H do? Chops off RNA that's in an RNA and a DNA <coughs> hybrid. So if you chop off that RNA, now you've got a place that you can put down your DNA. And so that's partly how these reverse transcriptases do the job. Once they have, double-stranded DNA. This double-stranded DNA binds to another viral protein. This is the viral integrase protein. 
which acts actually very, very similarly to the transposases that you, we talked about when we talked about the DNA-only transposons. It binds to both ends. It will find a piece of DNA. It cuts it in a slightly offset pattern. In that slightly offset pattern, you end up with a gap at either end. When you put the virus DNA in here, those gaps are filled by cellular polymerases. So now you have direct repeats on either side of these viral DNAs. Now, there's difference between these kinds of transposons and the DNA-only transposons, the question you asked about looking at sequences, in that at the ends of these genomes, instead of having the inverted repeats, which is what the transposase binds to, now you've got long direct repeat sequences, and that has to do how the viruses replicate again. We'll talk about that next term. But now you've got a short direct repeat outside the transposon and a longer direct repeat inside the transposon. This direct repeat sequence is also a really good promoter and leads to expression of lots of RNA, which then gets copied into DNA and inserted in the genome elsewhere. So these make many, many copies of themselves. The last one of these <coughs> transposons that I wanted to talk about are the so-called non-retroviral transposons. These are the guys that you can detect in the DNA when you're sequencing because they've got a long stretch of A's on one strand and T's on the other strand. And that basically tells you that this used to be a messenger RNA mm -hmm. and has now gotten into the DNA. How does that happen? This is actually a lot less well understood than what happens in the retroviral reverse transcription and integration because we know a lot about viruses because we can study them more easily. These are a lot harder to study. But what happens is you have transcription of this gene, and this gene turns out to be a reverse transcriptase and a endonuclease. Endonucleases do what? They cut in the middle of DNA. So the reverse transcriptase is made from this RNA that then, instead of working the way the virus ones do, this binds to poly A tails and then uses that poly A tail as a template to make DNA from. That then, the reverse transcriptase, just like the viral reverse transcriptase, will make the double-stranded DNA copy of this RNA and ends up integrating it into here. Multi-step pathway means you don't need to know all the details. Yes, good, right? Hmm? Yeah. So what this ends up with is now a copy of what you had over here, because it's gone through this RNA intermediate, this now somewhere else in the genome. And it turns out that that somewhere else in the genome is very often where you have a T or a couple of Ts, because those are the ones that are going to base pair with the As, which you already have at the end of your messenger RNA. The problem is you've got a whole bunch of Ts in your genome. So it's, it'll be a specific interaction, but a pretty non-specific interaction just because we have so many um, that's just two T's is actually enough to get the base pairing to take place to make these extensions um, of these particular nucleotides. So we'll stop here. We'll talk a little bit about site-specific recombination on Friday and then start talking about transcription. <laughs>